This evening, our guest is Dr. I.D.E. Thomas, author of The Omega Conspiracy. I'm Jim Cunningham, your host. Pastor Gary Roy isn't with us at this time. He may be on the road. He's usually with me on Friday evening, so, uh, so hopefully he'll get in here safely. But for the time being, I'm going to host the program, and we're fortunate tonight to have a guest with us who has written an outstanding book called The Omega Conspiracy, and I'm going to bring him on shortly. But before I do that, I want to do a little b backdrop to what we're talking about here. Our program uh, basically deals with paranormal material, and we're trying to basically raise the awareness of the Christian community on some activities that have been taking place throughout the centuries and even more so it seems in modern times and we're going to basically uh, want to deal with issues such as UFOs and what they might have uh, in uh, concern for us today. Uh, UFO sightings are on an incredible uh, increase at this time throughout the world and many people are fascinated by it. So uh, we're, we, I think we as Christians in light of prophecy, in, in light of scripture, are going to need to know more about that subject and deal with it and address it and hopefully uh, give an explanation as to what all this paranormal, uh, ign enigmatic uh, material is all about. So uh, tonight we're going to get into a book that is outstanding. I've read it for, uh, t uh, twice now and it just has a lot of information dealing with historical information concerning uh, uh, UFO phenomena and phenomena that is very strange in the mindset or in the paradigm of the thinking of men today. So uh, we just encourage you to, to listen closely and to be open uh, to the material that we're going to share with you because it, m m many people are not dealing with it at this time. Uh, one of the uh, first things I want to do as a backdrop is basically uh, share with you that there are many UFO sightings going on even here in Ohio. A Randolph woman reports UFO sighting and talks about how this UFO sighting, followed, this UFO followed her to her home and she watched it and, and determined it was something she believed not of this earth. Her name was Mary Heater. She received an unexpected visit Wednesday morning on her drive home from work. Heater said that while driving home along Interstate 76, at about 1 a.m., she spotted lights up in the sky. At first, she thought it was an airplane. Then she said, uh, now she's convinced that what she saw was an unidentified flying object. She said, I was fascinated. I don't know what, what it was, but I know it wasn't a plane. She watched the lights as it continued along Interstate 76 towards Ohio 44. She went to her home and basically stood on the porch and looked out and watched it sit there and hover. And she said all of a sudden it made a loud rushing wind type sound, kind of like a sound of an oil driller's popping the tops off the wells. And then she went in the house and tried to get her husband to come uh, look at it, and he wasn't the least bit interested. And that seems to be the attitude of a lot today. They're just, they just cannot believe that this phenomenon is real. So uh, also, there's another article here I have here I'd like to share with you. It's talking about confrontation at sea. Our military reportedly has had many UFO sightings over the last few decades, and uh, several people have written about that. One event took place in December 23, 1992. It says an Icelandic Coast Guard vessel and two gunboats uh, are ordered to take up stations on the northeast coast of Iceland at, uh, at uh, Langness, where the three UFOs were originally tracked two days earlier. The operation, cloaked in uh, a veil of se uh, secrecy, caused the crew much apprehension. And then it went on, and they had more sightings on the 24th, the 30th, and January the 12th, 93 goes on up through and this is an article out of I think a Sunday morning uh, newspaper here locally an insert where they did a special uh, coverage of that event so the UFO phenomena is a very real uh, issue that's with us today and uh, it's obvious that no one seems to have uh, an answer as to uh, what it's all about but I think biblically we can deal with it and should deal with it and we're going to attempt to do that somewhat tonight we're very fortunate, as I said earlier, to have a gentleman with us who has, who has written a number of books about a number of subjects, but several years ago he wrote a book called The Omega Conspiracy. His name is Dr. I.D.E. Thomas, and I, I want to tell you a little bit about him, his, his background, and I, hopefully I won't mess up too much here. Uh, there's some words in here I may have a little problem uh, pronouncing, but we'll do the best we can. But here is a little bit of a bio on Dr. Thomas. Uh, I.D.E. Thomas is one of the long, uh, a long uh, line of Welsh preachers, and he has traveled extensively in Europe, the Orient, and on the American continent. His sermons have been described in the press as powerful and passionate, intellectually articulate and spiritually probing. He's a native of Wales in the United Kingdom. Dr. Thomas has held three pastorates in the country, uh, in that country, the Amman Valley, and I'm going to say the Canaveron, and I know I'm not going to get this right, but I'm going to say something like Lanely. 
where he succeeded the uh, Reverend uh, Jubilee Young. For 10 years, he conducted special preaching missions in the UK and the US. He also served as a commentator for the BBC, which is the British Broadcasting Corporation. He is currently the senior pastor of the First Baptist Church of Maywood, California. He also lectures at two Los Angeles uh, seminaries and has authored several books which have enjoyed uh, circulation. I believe that Dr. Thomas also at this time is a chancellor of a theological seminary out in California, and I'm going to bring him on, and if he has something that he would like to add to that bio, we'd love to hear it. I'm sure there's, uh, there's a great deal more. I know in talking with him on the phone the other day, I was amazed to find out his age. He seems to have the energy, from what I can understand, of a man about 40 years old, but yet he is 76 years old and still going strong. Even though he has told me already in advance he's not feeling well tonight, we're going to try to uh, squeeze a little bit of time out of him and not hold him too long because I, I understand what he's saying. We just hope that you'll uh, listen closely and listen to what insight this man had. This book was written 10 years ago, and I read it again this week, and I'm amazed how current it still is today. It is so real like it was written last week dealing with this UFO phenomenon. So with that, I'm going to bring Thomas, Dr. Thomas on and uh, allow him to share with us some of his views on the material that he's written in our behalf. Dr. Thomas, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Cunningham. Thank you for being on your program. I hope you can hear me all right and understand my accent. As you heard, I was born and raised in the land of Wales, uh, and then moved to London, and finally to California. I travel a lot. I used to be for 25 years with the BBC, plus being a pastor here, and also the Chancellor of St. Charles University. Uh, I was asked a few years ago to give lectures for three months on UFOs from the Bible standpoint. Uh -huh. The three months became nine months. <laughs> it ended in a book and then a video. And I remember telling them in the class that in my opinion, the most important year since Pentecost was 1948. Uh -huh. I was born in Europe, as I told you, and it was in that year they started forming the World Council of Churches. Right. for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. um, many thought that would be the answer to all our problems, but I couldn't see it even then how by uniting two dead churches you're going to get one live church. Amen. Because uniting cemeteries don't lead to a resurrection. Uh -huh. 1948 in Europe we started the European Common Market at the Hague Congress. And uh, they're getting more unified every year. Some interpret that as a revived Roman Empire. Then we saw 48, even more amazing, the re-establishment of the State of Israel when David Ben-Gurion banged the table and when he was asked why you're doing it, he said the Bible is our mandate. Number four, 1948, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran. Mm -hmm. And there's one document there that influenced me a lot. I may refer to it later on the program. Number five, the space age began. 1948 experiments with liquid hydrogen proved that a rocket could descend beyond the Earth's gravitational pull. But number six, it was then that men began to appear. When we went into space, strange objects from space began to appear on the Earth. Uh, they've been here before, but there's a modern rash of UFO sightings that began in 1947-48. Kenneth Arnold was the man piloting his plane over the Cascade Mountains in Washington, and he saw those nine crescent-shaped disks and said they were like saucers skipping across the water. That word came into our vocabulary. And since that day, of course, millions of people around the world, particularly in America and in Russia, also in South America, and now in Europe, even in my own country of Wales, every year people have seen a UFO, and many also in Australia and other countries. So it's a great phenomenon of our time. Two American presidents have referred to it. Uh, Jimmy Carter saw a UFO twice, and Ronald Reagan also referred to it, and so did Mikhail Gorbachev in Russia mm -hmm. refer to it. And uh, no doubt it had some part in this new world order that's coming around. So we are living in an age when strange things are happening. Millions of 
people bear witness to the fact some are unknown, insignificant, some are celebrities from all over the world, but they all share that same fact. They've seen these UFOs appear and then disappear. How about yourself? Have you ever seen one? I have never seen one, but I've interviewed a lot of people who have. I have a cousin back in Wales, he saw one. And I've many ministers I've seen and other people, and many pilots have seen them, of course. And um, on Washington, on a radio program in Washington, two years ago, there was a woman who used to work for NASA in Houston. Donna Tietze, her name is. Right. And she stated that it was NASA's policy to erase UFOs from all their photos. Because mm-hmm. every moon trip they took, the astronauts had been followed by craft and saucers, but had been warned never to reveal it. Mm-hmm. So all over the world, is, these facts are coming in, and they can't be hidden forever, but there are millions of uh, witnesses who testify to the fact. I noticed in, uh, in chapter one of your book, The, the Cosmic Riddle, uh, it, it reads a little bit like this, and I'd like to get you to com- uh, comment on that, if you will, what your, what your implication is here. It says, 20th century man is still at a loss to explain the amazing knowledge and expertise that characterized some of the ancient uh, predecessors. Unlike primitive savages roaming wild and naked in the bush, they planned the pyramids, built Babylon, engineered Stonehenge, and structured uh, the Mayan uh, caracol. A thousand years before Darwin formed his theory of evolution, ancient Mayans and Toltecs carved uh, their own version of evolution in stone. Their calendar was more precise than ours today. They even knew and used penicillin. And like ancient uh, Egyptians, they designed great cities and mammoth pyramids. But from where or whom did they get their information and expertise? Uh, What is your... uh, the, the implication in your chapter here on the cosmic riddle, what is part of the outline and the idea that you're trying to convey in that? Well, first of all, uh, I believe, as one Canadian author has put it, that it was climax at the beginning. Uh, those early men were far better informed. Uh, they had knowledge, which we're beginning to have in our time. Now, the ancient Sumerian, the oldest civilization that is known, they knew the genesis of the universe. That's 6,000 years ago. And uh, what we came to know in the 1900s, they knew back then. Uh, They knew about the solar system. They knew about the planets. They knew about all those things, stars or suns could collapse and explode. And they had a wonderful knowledge of time. They divided the day between sunset and sunset into 12 double hours. 12 was a significant number. 12 was always unique. 12 signs of the zodiac, 12 months in a year. And although there are 24 hours in a day, we still have 12 hour clocks. Mm -hmm. Uh, 12 in a dozen. 12, 12, 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus chose 12 disciples, 12 apostles. But those ancient Sumerians knew that long, long time ago. Plus many, many other things that we have come to know in our time. Now the ancient Assyrians, 2,000 years before Christ appeared, uh, they encircled the planet Saturn with with uh, some serpents, signs of serpents. Now, how did they know of such rings? Because no other planet is depicted in that way. But they knew that uh, B.C., 1,400 B.C. Mm -hmm. The ancient Greeks knew there were seven stars in Pleiades. They could only see six. It was men much later that men were able to see seven, but some higher intelligence informed them. And also, I believe it was uh, back in the days of Enoch. Uh, Enoch had a book, the book of Enoch. Yes. And uh, in the time of Christ, it was the bestseller in the world. He influenced the Bible to a large extent. Enoch was known for his wisdom, for his knowledge, for his holiness. And uh, they refer to one of the great pyramids of Egypt as the Pillar of Enoch. Mm -hmm. There is that association. So man did not begin as a savage roaming in the wilds that knew nothing, but highly informed. At my opinion, that knowledge came from outside. 
Okay, this I'm above. Okay, fine. That that sets the stage for the next question. Then I noticed you mentioned a, a document earlier, and I'm going to assume that you're referring uh, to the uh, the uh, Genesis Apocryphon, which is in like manner to the uh, the Book of Enoch. Uh, do, are you saying that you believe that the Book of Enoch has at least a legitimate historical value, if not canon value, to us? Well, now the Book of Enoch is very hard to understand. Certainly not easy to read. Uh -huh. uh, when a famous Scottish pastor said, I've got the book of Enoch, but I don't understand a word of it, then I put the book down when I was young, never read it again, till about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. But now <clears throat> they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. And they thought at the beginning they had found uh, the doctrine of Lamech in it. Right. But it wasn't, it was the Genesis Apocrypha. Mm -hmm. But it uh, tells us a lot of things and enlarges on a lot of things found in the book of Genesis. Now, I base my, uh, any knowledge I have of UFOs, I base it not on what comes out of Hollywood, but what comes out of the Bible. And I believe the key to the whole thing is in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, right. in the days of Noah. And he's a key figure regarding prophecy for the future. Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Now many things happened, as we know, in the days of Noah. But the strangest thing of all was that the sons of God married the daughters of men. And giants were born, said the King James. Uh, originally, a better word than giants would be the Nephilim, the fallen ones. And I hold that the fallen ones, uh, the sons of God, were not the sons of Seth, and the daughters of men were not the daughters of Cain. Believers in the Old Testament never refer to sons of God. Sons of God in the Old Testament are a race of, race of persons lower than God but higher than man, mm -hmm. the angels. And I hold that in Genesis chapter 6, when the sons of God uh, are children from the daughters of men, then a feeling appeared upon the earth. And when that appeared, God immediately said, destroy the human race. Something has happened that will contaminate uh, the, the human race. They must be destroyed. And you remember the flood came in the same chapter. God regretted he had ever made man. And we find that the flood came and only eight people survived, Noah and his family. Now going back to the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is that book, the Genesis Apocrypha. Uh, although it's not the law, lost book of Lamech, yet it tells us a lot about Lamech. He was the son of Methuselah, and Lamech was the father of Noah. Now we are told the Apocrypha mentioned the Nephilim, and um, has direct reference to the sons of God and the daughters of men. Now, unfortunately, the scroll for a long time had been mutilated by the ravages of time, but they've been able to translate most of it. And it makes it very clear. It's a very interesting story. Uh, Lamech had been away from home on a long journey. And when he finally returned, he discovered to his chagrin that his wife, Pat Enosh, had given birth to baby boy in his absence. Mm -hmm. Now, he knew that he could not be... That child could not have been sired by him. He was not the father. And the child bore no resemblance to him whatsoever or to anybody in the family. But adding to the mystery was the fact that the boy was extremely beautiful. And when he opened his eyes, the whole house would light up. And Lamech said, he has not sprung from me, but from the angels. The Nephilim, the, uh, these alien beings from space, they've been here. Well, he chastised his wife for infidelity. But that he knows his wife swore by all that was sacred to her that Lamech himself sired the child. She said, I have not been with any other man, nor with a stranger, and notice, nor with a heavenly being or a watcher. That's the name that's used in the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what was Lamech to do? Uh... Could this child have been conceived by some heavenly beings? So he went to his father, Methuselah. And Methuselah went to his father, the great and the wise and the godly Enoch. And the family knew at once that 
something had to be done. Now Enoch means in the intelligent, the learned one. And so Enoch told them, this is a sign that the earth will soon be visited by a terrible catastrophe and judgment. The human race, said Enoch, is in grave danger. But as for this little boy whose birth is a mystery, he advised Lamech to raise him as his own child, and he should be called Noah. And that's where Noah comes from, and he was the only one who was able to survive the flood, he and his family, and was able to bring a new race of human beings into existence upon the earth. That's a story of the Qumran, of the, the document they found, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Are there any other documents that refer to the Watchers other than that? Oh, yes. Uh, besides the Bible, you know, the, I mentioned the book of Enoch. Yes. It's not in the Bible. Okay. Wasn't but there... if you go to Abyssinia or Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and they've got a very ancient Bible. The first book in the Ethiopian Bible is the book of Enoch. Mm -hmm. It's even before Genesis. Uh, but that's the only Bible today that includes it. But there are other books as well. Uh, uh, the Book of Enoch, let me see what I can remember. There's the Jubilee. The Book of Yeshua. The Book of um, the Zadokite Document. Mm -hmm. The Apocalypse of Barak. The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. A lot of these ancient bo uh, books, they don't tell us too much, but they refer to it. Mm -hmm. And what is surprising, as Schaeffer said, Francis Schaeffer, all over the world, these myths that have persisted, they all seem to have a common core. Uh, we can't uh, prove anything, but it, it's surprising. He said all over the world, people didn't know each other, but they all seem to believe that strange beings from space, like the Nephilim of the book of Genesis, appeared upon the earth mm -hmm. and contaminated the human race. I noticed that uh, in... Uh your book, you also says in the book of Enoch, other significant facts are given about the patriarch. I notice also, I was going to ask the question, I know what Jude said. Uh, it, uh, where did we get this script? There, are there any other documents that you know of that where this statement is made other than Enoch? It says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to ex execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Is there any other document that you know of other than Jude that made uh, that statement? At the moment, I haven't considered that, but I'm sure there is. Now, the book of Enoch, as you said, it is quoted in the Bible, uh -huh. in the book of Jude. Uh -huh. uh, it's quoted there, although it's not in our Bible today. The uh, book of Jude refers to it. Uh, I think it's the sixth verse. If anybody asks what chapter, it means you don't know. <laughs> uh, it has only one chapter. Right. But uh, it also refers to the Gregori, or the fallen angels. Uh -huh. It refers to as watchers. And one, two significant facts. Uh, they descended to the earth, these sons of God, uh, these angelic beings, the fallen angels, in the days of Jared. Now, Jared was the father of Enoch. And they used to be in America, but I don't think they exist anymore, a group called the Sons of Jared. And they had a publication called the Jaredite Advocate. Uh, but I don't see it anymore. Uh -huh. But Jared, well, they, it was in his time that all this appeared. Uh, the Nephilim did appear once again in the Book of Numbers, mm -hmm. but on a much smaller scale. And in those days, they were giants. Well, let me read that text so everybody, in the event somebody's not familiar with it, and I'm going to be reading it from the New International Version, chapter 6 of Genesis, and it reads this way. It says, When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. What does that mean also afterwards? What do you think that means? Well, I believe they appeared in the book of Numbers. I think it's Numbers chapter 13. Uh -huh. You remember when the, uh, the spies went in, when the Israelites were coming up to Canaan right. from Egypt? They sent spies ahead and they said, Don't enter. They are much bigger than we are. We are like grasshoppers. They're sight, big walls, cities, and so on. 
But the, the other spies of Joshua and Caleb said, let's go in. And they conquered them. And the order from God was destroy them all, even the children. Complete eradication because in Canaan at that time, the Rephaim and the Nephilim were there. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones like the fallen angels in the book of Genesis were influencing the pagan people of Canaan. And that's why God destroyed them all, just as he destroyed people in the flood. Do you feel that these individuals took on human form when they came down and intermingled with the Adamite women? Now, that is a question I always get. Uh, how could uh, an angel have sexual relationship with a woman of earth? Well, now, they can incarnate. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we read of angels going to see Abraham and having supper or dinner with him and spending the night with him. They went to uh, warn Lot. They spent the night in Sodom with Lot. They can incarnate. Mm -hmm. It's not always easy to, uh, to understand, but there are some things in the Bible that are told us we just have to believe them. What do you think the reason for them, uh, their intermingling was? What, for what reason did they come down uh, uh, to intermingle with the Adamite women? Well, I believe to destroy the human race, the people of God, uh -huh. and that's why God intervened so so quickly in the matter uh, to change the, to contaminate the, the human race, and uh, that's why I believe it, it could very well happen again. We may be seeing the beginning of the scenario of the last days when they will come again, and this time Christ himself promised to come back. Mm -hmm. He will come back and they will be beaten again in the final day. Is this well received, Don? Uh, it's been some time since you've written your book, and I know you probably had some second thoughts after you wrote the book, but is this being well received with the, the people that you fellowship around the world? Your thought on the... Well, uh, what is surprising is the book, as it has been out over ten years, I still get called at least once a week, <laughs> or a letter. Yeah. Some from scientists. Uh -huh. Some from people in the Air Force. Uh, some from scholars who are writing their own books. All sorts of people. Now, I met some pastors who disagree. Uh -huh. They believe that the sons of God were the sons of Seth, and the daughters of man were the daughters of Cain. They disagree. But I take them back, and I say that the Old Testament uh, rabbis, uh, who knew the Bible better, language better than we do, all testified that they're fallen angels. So did Josephus, so did all the early church fathers one after the other, for the first 500 years. And since then, it's been forgotten, until our time. And I've been surprised how many, well, I could name two pastors, but I better not <laughs> give their names on the air. Okay. Two pastors, well-known evangelical pastors in America, have changed their mind. One is the president of a, a large seminary, changed their mind on the subject. They went back to Josephus, went further back to the uh, Tertullian, and the other fathers, and they came up with the same conclusion as I did, mm -hmm. that uh, you cannot say they were giants in an earthly sense, but as the Bible said, they're feeling the fallen ones. Right. Well, this brings up the, the uh, to follow up on that question a little further. You've, you've had 10 years, and I don't know whether you continue to research this or think about it, but I'm curious to know your thinking on today. The phenomena seems to be a little bit different. It seems like women are being taken out of their beds at night, and they're being impregnated, if you listen to their stories, and hybrids are being formed in them, and they're being taken uh, before, the, uh, before the first or second trimester. What do you think that's all about? Is that some new approach that's going on just to deceive, or what? Well, no, I'm not an authority on that, but when the UFOs come, somebody drives them. Uh -huh. Somebody's in charge. Uh, somebody will be, has to be inside that vehicle. And I believe I, many of these things are possible, although we don't fully understand them. But we can't rationalize everything in the Bible. Mm -hmm. We have to accept it. But I believe that there are many threads in the Bible that speaks about this. Take a very simple verse in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul, uh, telling the women to have their heads covered. Correct. And I was raised in an age when every woman went to church had her head covered. They didn't know why, but that was the custom. It's long forgotten. But Paul tells them why, because of the angels. Uh, and the old rabbis used to teach those fallen angels were looking down and they were 
saw the beautiful hair of the women on earth as they looked down, and that's why they came and seduced them. Mm -hmm. Paul says, uh, cover your heads because of the angels. Mm -hmm. But that little thread that in the book of Isaiah, or Jeremiah maybe, about the Rephaim, mm -hmm. similar breed to the Nephilim, uh, there is no resurrection for the Rephaims. Uh, they die, but there's no resurrection. That's only for Christian people created by God. The, uh, the Rephaim are basically descendants of the uh, Nephilim and Anak right, and that family. Right, right. And they were in Canaan in the days of the book of Numbers. Uh -huh. Do you feel that the UFO phenomena today is increasing because of uh, prophetic events that are coming in? I think so. What is very strange, living so near Hollywood, uh -huh. uh, many films have been churned out by Hollywood on this subject. And what is uh, strange is this, that non-believers are able to accept it easier than many of us who are Christians. Mm -hmm. they, they see no problem. Rosemary's baby came out the demonic father and the human mother. They accepted that, but we as Christians are very uh, uh, slow in accepting that. But uh, the Bible is very clear that the key to the future is with Noah, as in the days of Noah. Now, many things happened in the days of Noah, but the outstanding thing is these strange beings from space appeared. Now, we say that we're going to see wars and rumors of wars, famines and all that, uh, toward the end. We've always seen them. For hundreds of years there have been wars and rumors of wars and famine and plagues all down history. But there's one thing that happened in the days of Noah that did not happen again, but it seems to be resurfacing in our time. What do you think, uh, where did the, uh, 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 the sons of, the, these sons of God that are referred to in Genesis 6, are these, uh, surely can't be creatures that are in uh, good relationship with the Creator, who are they associated with? If they're, if they're not uh, godly angels, then where do they, uh, they get their origin from? Then when it came down... Well, they, were, they were all created by God, uh -huh. but uh, they divided you know, the good and the bad. Uh, some fallen angels, some good angels, just uh, good human beings and bad, uh, but all created by God, but some are cast out of heaven. Well, Satan was one of them, uh -huh. Lucifer, one of the archangels, uh, son of the morning. He was cast out. And often they still refer to as sons of God. Because you remember in the book of Job, uh, twice this term appears, uh, where these um, the sons of God shouted with joy during the creation of the world. Mm -hmm. Sons of God shouted for joy. Well, now, Adam had not been created at that time. So they must have been angelic beings. Mm -hmm. And Satan once was with the sons of God. It was a term that was used in those early days. So that, had, that basically, uh, if we use biblical text, we'll find out in Isaiah chapter 12, Lucifer rebelled against God, and he apparently uh, uh, persuaded a number of these uh, agents to go along with him in that rebellion. Is that but, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And you see, the, the destiny of the angels are different destiny of human beings. Uh -huh. Now, God created the, the heavens for the angels. He didn't create heavens for us. Mm -hmm. he, for us, He's going to create a new earth, which we are kin to heaven. But heaven was made for the angels, and man was made for the earth, and be a new earth one day, mm -hmm. created by God. If I may go back, I mentioned... Um, the Rephaim, uh, it's in Isaiah chapter 26, where it says there's, there's no resurrection for the uh, Nephilim or the Rephaim. They are dead, they shall not live, they are deceased, they shall not rise. Mm -hmm. Now the word deceased in English, in Hebrew is Rephaim. So there's no resurrection for the fallen angels. And they are, the Jew tells us a lot about them, of course and the sin they committed. You will remember in the book, I'll go back to, and I believe Peter does the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Jude, verse 6 and 7. Uh, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he have reserved in everlasting chains and unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner 
giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. Mm -hmm. Now that's exactly what happened in Genesis 6. They left their own habitation. And the word is in the air is tense. They left it for good. It was a, they crossed the Rubicon. Mm -hmm. Never could to go back. They left their own habitation, which is heaven. Heaven was not made for man, earth for man. And uh, they went after strange flesh. And the word strange there is not the same uh, type of the same race of beings. Right. Strange flesh. It happened in Sodom. It happened in Genesis chapter 6. It's basically something like the same uh, sin of homosexuality uh, today. Yes, similarly, that, that is strange, although the uh, two men or two women can be there, sure. but here there are two different races. I see. I notice that in, in Revelation chapter 12, it talks about this event. Uh, I'm wondering how you read this. Do you read this as a future tense event when it talks about Revelation chapter 12? He said, I, uh, John said, I saw a uh, great and wondrous sign appear in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain, and she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Uh, is that referring to Lucifer uh, uh, and his rebellion of Isaiah 14 also? Did those two scriptures go together? And does that demonstrate that uh, that uh, a third of the angels might have rebelled, a third of uh, angels might have rebelled against God at one time in the past? No, many people believe that. I haven't personally given enough study, okay. but that could quite be possible. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you say? Uh, before I finish, may I say one other thing? Um, sure. People always ask me, why was Noah selected by God uh, to escape the flood and to be the progenitor of the new race upon earth? Well, the answer is given us again in Genesis. It says Noah was a just man. Uh, just man, he stood, he was an example of righteousness, we know that, and godliness in a very perverse age. And like uh, Enoch, before him, he walked with God. Uh, and yet we know he sinned, and he sinned after the flood, and the Bible tells us that. But Noah's a point for one reason, Genesis 6, verse 9, he was perfect in his generations. Mm -hmm. Now, he couldn't have been morally perfect, nor spiritually perfect, because he wasn't. Uh, but the word tamim, from taman, means without blemish. He was physically without blemish. Like the lamb for the slaughter, the sacrificial lamb uh, had to be without any physical blemish. That meant perfection. So in Noah's case, he'd been uncontaminated by these alien invaders from space. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's why God appointed Noah and his family. They have preserved their pedigree and kept it pure in spite of all the corruption that was going on all around them. Somebody said it uh, Noah's bloodline remained free of genetic contamination. Mm -hmm. So in light of all of this that's going on right now, you're basically saying what we're seeing going on in our midst is of the fallen angel demonic side. What would your advice be to anyone that is interested in this material or involved with it at this time? What would you admonish them to do if they're in correspondence with these creatures? Well, I, my, my, my thing would be that, that um, they are fallen angels, they're not good in fallen angels, whatever signs they may give, but ultimately they'll all come under the authority of Christ. Uh -huh. He will come, and he will be, as we say so often, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the kingdom will belong to him. Now, I believe they will try to take over the earth, the human race, as they did before they try and win the human race away from God and to themselves. That was uh, Lucifer, Satan's idea from the beginning. Uh, to corrupt the human race away from God to himself. Mm -hmm. He did corrupt the human race, but they didn't all go over to Satan. They went back to God. And as long as we believe in God, we're on the winning side. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thomas, for being with us tonight. We appreciate your, con your contribution. Later on, I'm going to give an ad about your book and tell people how to get it. Is there an address that you would like to give out to, if anybody wanted to contact you? To to coming, um, yeah, my address for the next two months would be the First Baptist Church, 
3759 East 57th Street, Maywood, California, 90270. Very good, Doctor. I appreciate your... Thank you. Nice being on your program. God bless you. And to hear you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening, sir. Thank you. Goodbye. All right. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Thomas, uh, and some startling revelations, I, I imagine, for some concerning uh, the fact that we may once again see fallen angels come to the earth. A number of scholars have debated this issue over the centuries, and it seems like the debate is heating up in the hour that we live. Many people are beginning to believe that fallen angels were involved in uh, intermingling with the uh, uh, family uh, during uh, the family on earth during Noah's time, and that's the reason why God destroyed it. If that's true, it's very possible that what we see going on now is a replication of that, only maybe in a different way. Perhaps they're not coming down literally let, yet where we can see them physically stepping to the earth and making claims that would contradict some of our belief systems, but very possibly they are programming people right now as many people claim that are being abducted by these creatures or they claim they're being abducted that they're being taken and prepared for an hour in the future that whenever these individuals show up that they will take up their stations that they've been appointed to and do what they've been instructed and admonished to do to set up a new world kingdom uh, on this planet the scriptures do talk about that it, they talk about a new world order they talk about a one world religion Revelations chapter 12 and 13 talks about the time when Lucifer is going to be cast down upon the earth in the end of the age and that it says, Woe be to the uh, earth and the inhabitants of the sea, the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, because Satan has come down to you and he knows that his time is short. So if that is a literal uh, event where someone is going to step out of the cosmos and make some claims that contradict the accepted Hebrew Christian history up to this point, we may have to deal with that. And if that's so, we as Christians need to be prepared to do that.